Good evening and welcome to your Choice 2024 NTTV's coverage of the March Super Tuesday primary. I'm Mauricio Ortiz Segura. And I'm Brooke Deering. For the next hour or so, we will focus on a number of topics critical to North Texas and to our student body. With that in mind, we have sent crews to our state capitol in Austin, as well as a number of live watch parties. We're also featuring a number of dynamic perspectives by touching base with nationwide political groups, our panel of local political experts, and our viewers with our social media hosts. But first, let's bring you up to date this evening. The American election process is fairly complicated, and you may wonder, what is a primary? Well, a primary is the process used by a political party to choose which candidate will be going into the general election. The winner of the primary becomes the party candidate. They are chosen by the party voters to run in November against the other party's nominee. For example, if former President Trump wins the Republican nomination and current President Biden wins the Democratic nomination, then they will go against each other in the presidential election this November 5th. While primaries are directly related to the national elections, each state makes its own rules. Texas is considered an open primary state, meaning voters can actually cast a ballot in either party, whether they are registered with that party or not. Usually everyone goes to primary locations, then requests a ballot for the party of their choice. But this year, things are different in Denton County. The state of Texas allows counties to opt out of providing countywide general polling locations. So today, Denton residents had to find their party's specific voting location based on their precinct in order to vote. Although Denton has provided countywide polling locations in the past, local party disagreements changed that tradition for this election. As of yesterday, 96 out of the 254 Texas counties were approved for countywide open voting. Denton County Election Administrator Frank Phillips anticipates this will also be the case for the presidential election in November. And while November might seem a ways off, there is still a lot of political action tonight, not just here, but around the state. As you can see, we've sent reporters out into the field tonight to conduct some interviews you won't want to miss. Let's first go to our reporter out in Austin, April Pierdon. April, how are you feeling out there? Thanks guys, it was quite the drive, but I finally made it here to Austin. And as you can't tell, I am currently inside the Texas Capitol building, just admiring this beautiful architecture, but also understanding and um, highlighting that there are a lot of matters being discussed and happening here on a daily basis. I'll be highlighting a couple of these points um, as well as throughout the broadcast. But before I do that, let's check to see how our reporter Kayla Bumpus is doing at the Matthew Luigi's watch party in Arlington. Kayla. Thanks, April. I'm here at candidate Matthew Lucci's watch party over at Jay Gilligan's Barn Grill in Arlington. In just a few moments, this room will be filled with excited Republicans that are here to see if their favorite representatives will win their nominations. Republicans are looking to push for many things after these elections, such as stricter immigration laws, tougher border control, and more. We'll be asking around to see just what people here are feeling about these elections, but that'll happen later on. For now, let's take it to our our live shot anchor James Peeler at a Democratic watch party. Thank you very kindly, Kayla. I'm here with the Colin Rod campaign at the Rodeo Go in Dallas. Colin Rod is one of the many candidates seeking in the Democratic nomination to go against Ted Cruz this November. Allred has been in the uh, Allred has been in the House since 2018's midterms, but has since had his sights on the Senate. And should he get the nomination tonight, he'll be going up against Ted Cruz. Cruz has been in the Senate since the 2012 midterms. Now, let's go over to Drew up in Denton with a wonderful group called Common Cause. What's going on, Drew? Thanks, James. Well, I'm here in NTTV's lobby with Marlisa Marine from Common Cause, who is the election protection manager with them. They are a nonpartisan organization that makes sure that the polls are fair and democratic. Well, first of all, Marlisa, how are you doing tonight? I mean, it is Super Tuesday. It's a big night for you guys. How's it going? It's, it's going. going. Thank, Thank you guys, guys so, much so much for having, having us. us. Absolutely. Well, but before we get too ahead of ourselves and start asking you questions, let's go back into the studio with Brooke and Mauricio and see all we're going to talk about today on the Super Tuesday show. Guys? 
Thanks, Drew. We will come back to all of our live reporters later in the show. But in addition to our live coverage, we have a special NTTV UNT student media poll in which you and you'll hear from our students what matters to them in the election cycle. Our Spanish language Noticias colleagues will also be covering this election and we'll be joining them with a full update on voting and other issues surrounding this election. But as we all know, there is so much to consider in this primary as it leads into the November general election. To help us make sense of that, we have NTTV's Avery Callens in our Chilton studio with a panel of UNT experts. Avery? Thanks, you too. Let me give you a quick panel introduction now, and then we will turn to each of them later in the broadcast for their takes on tonight's events and topics. With us is Professor Randy Loftus, an award-winning journalist who has worked for over 30 years as an environmental and investigative reporter. Jason Bumo, a graduate student working on his PhD here at UNT who studies conscientious politics globally and here in the U.S. And Michael Elwell, who is also a graduate student working on his PhD here at UNT his field of study is American politics. We'll hear more about their observations on the hot button issues later in the broadcast. But for now, Brooke and Mauricio, back to you in Studio B. Thanks, Avery. Primaries are especially known for low turnout. Essentially, a few people make the big decisions for all of us. NTTV went to our students and asked them what issues concern them. NTTV's Brian Clark and Sydney Johnson have been helping cold the responses and have more from our social media center. How do those responses look, you two? Thanks, Brooke. The responses we got contain some valuable insights. That's right, Brian. I think our audience will be surprised. This week, our marketing specialist, Taryn Mosley, worked with our social media team to ask UNT students what they're thinking about when they go to the polls. Our Instagram page at North Texas TV will be providing live updates and exclusive content from our live shot reporters tonight. But throughout this show, we'll be discussing what topics and issues students find the most important. These young voters care about a wide range of issues. Most choose to support a candidate based on their stance of key issues. These including protecting democracy, inflation concerns, immigration, press freedom, and ending bipartisanship. These young voters are showing up to vote. 2018, 2020, and 2022 were three of the highest turnout elections in U.S. history. This lines up with our findings, as 84% of those polled reported that they were voting in this year's primary. 47% of UNT students are voting in all elections, and another 41% are voting specifically in national elections. You know, UNT is showing up this year. I'm excited to see hashtag vote on my following page. Speaking of social media, students trust their phones. 79% of students get their news from social media, and only 13 getting from traditional news like television shows and newspapers. A student told us that for young voters, social media has now become one of the most important tools. Political candidates know this, using the algorithm to their advantage. Now they can easily find demographics more likely to vote for their party. A student said social media has voters to be plugged in with different ways to connect with possible candidates and issues. In general, social media has given more opportunities for struggling voters. We will continue updating you with our social media findings as the night goes on. But for now, back to you all in Studio B. Thank you, Brian and Sydney. As exciting as social media can be, these watch parties will be plenty exciting for our reporters who are out live. Let's check in with Kayla Bumpus right now to see how the Republicans are doing out in Arlington. Kayla? Thanks, Mauricio. This watch party is important for Matthew Lucci as this is the first time he runs for office. He's looking to take the 25th seat in the House of Representatives from the 25th District's incumbent, Roger Williams. On his website, he says, it's time for someone that actually represents us. It's time for a representative who will finally deliver for our district. It's time to take our country back. Now that's enough excitement from here. Now I'm going to pitch it over to James Peeler at the watch party. James. Thank you very kindly, Kayla. Colorado has been the steady front runner of this race for the Democratic nomination. In his bid for re-election to his House seat in the 2022 midterms, he won with over 50 percent of the vote. In the House, already sponsored a number of bills in committee, and his voting record has been con consistently moderate. Every two years, all 435 seats in the House are up for re-election. The candidates vying for Allred's seat in the House this year 
include State Representative Julie Johnson and Dr. Brian Williams, a trauma surgeon. That's all for me here now. Let's go back to Denton with, with Mauricio and Brooke. Thanks, James. When we come back, an update on the numbers here in Texas. And we'll turn our attention to other issues, including one that has become a major concern in this county. The, polit the political divide and its impact on our government. Stay with us. Live from UNT, it's Wheel of or what? Culture. I said county and country. I was like, county. You said country. Well, country. Welcome back to Wheel of Culture. Our contestant is so close to solving this puzzle. Country. But first, it's time to give the wheel a spin. Wow, you landed on London, one of the many places where you and your fellow students can go on a chance to experience new culture. But only if you can solve this puzzle. I'd like to solve the puzzle. Study abroad. That's correct. You just want yourself a trip to study abroad in London, England, and you can too. Just go to studyabroad.unt.edu to see deadlines and apply for scholarships. Get ready to study abroad. I'm so tired. I feel ugly. I'm not okay. I didn't know UNT had counseling services. Maybe I should check it out. This looks like the place. minute walk. I don't want to do this right now. Don't worry, you can just use Transit. Transit? What's that? Transit is a mobile app that provides real-time tracking to connect buses, UNT shuttles, and even A-trains. Simply download the app, then tap on the search bar and type where you want to go. In a matter of seconds, you get results for all available routes. And the best part of it is, it's completely free for UNT students. What are you doing? I'm downloading it right now. Download Transit today and remember, make life better without a car. Willis Library, located at the University of North Texas. It has computers, printers, and the building is open 24-7. By going online, you can book up to an hour of reserved space at one of the many private study rooms. Many of them are equipped with whiteboards, a table, and a TV to hook up to your computer. Textbooks can be checked out for free with a student ID. They also have many of these in ebook forms. This is still a library, so always remember to be quiet and respectful of other surroundings, especially in certain places where talking is not allowed. For example, the third and fourth floor are completely quiet. As you can see, Willis Library has many options for students, with it offering many media sources and staying open all the time. So a man's been walking in the desert for days at a time. He finally comes across a bar and orders a Coke. That's not funny. Eh? Eh? We've had a bit of time to let some of the votes from this election come in. Here's what we have for you at the moment. Representative Brandon Gill is in the lead for the Republican Congressional District 26. This is a highly competitive district because the longtime incumbent Michael Burgess retired. A number of Republicans are vying for the seat, but at 
all the, at the moment, Gil is in the lead. Those are the numbers we have for right now, but we'll keep you updated on how these numbers change throughout the show. Well, there is no question Texas politics and politicians have become well known around the country. Whether it is Governor Abbott's controversial approach to immigration, such as busing people to other states or putting in barriers and police along the border with Mexico. Our current attorney general being tried and then cleared by the Texas Senate on various charges or the highly conservative approach the state legislature has taken on social and educational issues like reproductive rights and library books in schools. The result of these politi political moves in our state and in others around the country is causing talk of a divided country rather than a unified one, a country where compromise is hard to find. Trump back in office because that was the one that fixed this country the first time. You ain't nothing but a neocon. Um, probably the Republicans. <laughs> I was waiting for that to happen, but uh, we have a fool, a fool as a president. Are you a Republican or a Democrat? This is the question that is leading the future of American politics as political ideologies continue to polarize. According to Pew Research Center, Republicans and Democrats are more divided along ideological lines and partisan antipathy is deeper and more extensive than at any point in the last two decades, changing the narrative on finding middle ground. But Donald Trump? Oh. He spent a lifetime tearing us down and devaluing our existence. In today's society, there is a gravity of radicalism that has seemed to completely undermine compromise. This has bled into our everyday communication as well. The overall share of Americans who express consistently conservative or consistently liberal opinions has doubled over the past two decades from 10 to 21 percent. And ideological thinking is now much more closely aligned with partisanship than in the past. As a result, ideological overlap between the two parties has diminished. Today, 92 percent of Republicans are to the right of the median Democrat and 94 of Democrats are to the left of the median Republican. People feel more inclined to resonate with the political ideals of a party rather than create their own opinions and beliefs. And many researchers have led this to the gradual transition from the idea of a political opponent to now a political enemy. Let's just say it's a fight between good and evil. And a lot of what's been happening is evil. In a study conducted in 2022, Republicans and Democrats are as likely to point to the harm of the other party's policies as a major reason for affiliating with their party as they are to point to the good of their party's policies. And in an earlier study, researchers found that 45% of Republicans view the opposing party to be a threat to the nation's well-being. And 41% of Democrats held the exact same reaction. It is because of the negative affiliations that people feel pulled to choose the lesser of two evils. A divided country can't function properly, so this polarization could be a threat to democracy. With this being said, let's head over to NTTV's Avery Callens and our panel of experts for their take on this seeming shift in American politics and what they might mean. Avery? Thanks, Brooke. I want to begin with one of the most glaringly obvious issues impacting voters across the nation, political polarization. To what extent does political polarization inhibit the election and a number of other governmental processes? Professor Loftus, we can start with you. What are your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> polarization is really nothing new. Uh, there have been many times in history when the nation has been really deeply, badly divided. But today's digital communication, instant communication of everybody's opinions, puts it in our face a lot more often. So certainly the impact of social media and 24-7 news cycles has made this seem more immediate to us. But in fact, it's, it's been that way many times during the, during the history of the country. Yes, it's very insightful. Mr. Elwell, what about you? So polarization is one of these things that's really <clears throat> yucky and weird when it comes to American politics, right? Um, all, all the science and the literature says that we as people really like uh, being with people that share our views. And so what happens is we, we get this, this phenomenon where we select into districts and into neighborhoods with people that think like we do. 
And this only furthers the problem, right? It keeps growing this divide and, and keeping this divide going further. Um, and it's, it's resulting in us electing representatives that are more polarized, and it's locking up the system more. And it's, it's even getting so bad to where people are starting to deny election results over it and things like that. Mr. Buno, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think that this goes beyond, as you were saying, in the environmental, but it's also our digital environment. Uh, as we were talking about with social media, uh, the algorithms that we place ourselves into kind of spiral and they build and they, they uh, develop uh, like more and more entrenched ideas about partisanship. And then these are reflected in our real world where it is impacting our elections, it's impacting whether we accept it, uh, it's impacting how we go to the polls. There are people who have gone out armed and people who are going to where you would drop off a mail-in vote, for instance. And it's really starting to do damage to our democratic system to have the parties be so at odds with each other. Yes, and bouncing off of that, is there any way we can slowly ease our way out of this political tension conundrum we found ourselves in? Uh, Mr. Elwell, we can start with you. Well, touching on what Mr. Buno and Mr. Loftus have been saying, right, this, this digital environment, right, the, the way we self-select into these echo chambers, it's really hard to pull ourselves out of that. You know, it's really difficult when you just have access to what you want to hear. Mr. Loftus, anything to add? I think one of the things that the news media could do is take a more responsible approach to deciding what is the biggest news of the day. Quite often the biggest news of the day is somebody said something outrageous instead of some policy that actually affects the welfare of people. We need to maybe ramp down the emotional aspect a little bit and really do more coverage that looks at what is and is not good governance as opposed to just the latest uh, social outrage. Yeah, Mr. Buno, do you have anything to add to that? And it, this really goes down to uh, that, the cultural aspect to some of this, where it is a, uh, uh, how it is portrayed is less about the actual policy making, but it is about uh, how it is framed by the media. Uh, <laughs> I, That's totally no. okay. You were saying it tracks the media. I, but it also, there's also a little bit of onus on the individual to destigmatize talking about politics, to normalize it with their friends, to be able to have civil conversations so that we can uh, bring these things back in from the very from the extremes that we're seeing. Yeah, and that's really important to keep in mind, especially with this upcoming presidential election. We will be returning again later in the show, but for now, Mauricio, back to you in Studio B. Thanks, Avery. Texas politics and social media have had their differences. Governor Greg Abbott and Attorney General Ken Paxton have spearheaded efforts to limit the impact of social media companies in the state. April Pierdot is live in Austin with more on the story. April? Thanks, Mauricio. Tonight, we turn the focus to a case that's been in the making for three years, originating right here in the state capitol. And so yesterday, um, the U.S. Supreme Court began hearing arguments from tech companies Net Choice and Computer and Communications Industry Association, also known as CC. IA against a social media law created by the state governments of Texas and Florida following the January 6th insurrection in 2021. And so the, the Texas law in question would prevent social media companies such as Twitter and TikTok from removing content based on a creator's political attitudes. This would limit the ability of social media corporations to moderate content, a restriction that Net Choice and CCIA are calling unconstitutional. The Supreme Court justices are conflicted over what the repercussions could be, but they, um, as they are declared in its entirety, that could be unconstitutional. And they are also are considering um, whether sending the case back to the lower courts for further uh, for further debate according to Texas a Tribune. And so the court is um, required to do a, um, a final 
a final decision by the end of June 2024. I'll, uh, I'll stay tuned to talk a little bit more about uh, what's happening in Texas later on, but for now, back to you and Denton in Studio B. Thanks, April. We'll check back in with you later in the show. And we're going to send it over to our colleagues on the Spanish news desk in Chilton for an election update with Noticias anchors Ramiro Cuellar and Omar Martinez. ¿Cómo les va por ahí, chicos? Muchas gracias, Mauricio. Bienvenidos a la cobertura en, es en español de las elecciones primarias de 2024. Yo soy Omar Martínez. Y yo soy Ramiro Cuellar. Actualmente, los números se encuentran de la siguiente manera. En el Distrito Congresional 26, el congresista Michael C. Berger se ha decidido retirar y para tomar su puesto en, la, en las primarias republicanas, en primer lugar se encuentra Gil con el 57.8% de votos y un total de 24,160 votos. En segundo lugar se encuentra Armey con el 15.8% y un total de 6,606 votos. Y mientras en el tercer lugar se encuentra Hoffman con el 10.4% y 4,340 total de votos. En la carrera presidencial para el Partido Republicano, en primer lugar está arrasando el presidente Trump con el 74% de los votos y en segundo lugar se encuentra Haley con el 20.6% de los votos. En el Partido Demócrata, Biden también está arrasando en su partido con el 88.9% de los votos. Y bueno, esos son todo, todos los resultados que les tenemos por el momento. Y los legisladores de la Cámara de Representantes del Estado de Georgia aprobaron el jueves 29 de febrero el proyecto de Ley 1105, también conocido como Ley de Seguimiento e Información de Extranjeros Criminales de Georgia. Esta ley obligaría a todos los departamentos de policía a ayudar a identificar a los inmigrantes indocumentados, detenerlos y retenerlos para su deportación. El proyecto de ley también exigiría a estos departamentos publicar un informe cada 90 días con datos detallados sobre la situación migratoria, los delitos y los países de origen de los reclusos que no son ciudadanos de los Estados Unidos. El proyecto de ley pasa ahora al pleno del Senado Estatal para seguir debatiendo su aprobación. La Corte Suprema de Estados Unidos detuvo temporalmente el lunes por la noche la nueva ley estatal que permite a la policía de Texas detener a las personas sospechosas de cruzar ilegalmente la frontera entre Texas y México. El máximo tribunal del país suspendió... Sorry, we're experiencing some technical difficulties, but when we come back, a look at how education is faring in this election cycle. What is the impact of increasing government involvement with education? We'll take a look at what our students are thinking and saying on social media. And we'll find out how the various watch parties and events around the area are going and update on the vote count. So stay with us. Hey Alex, this guy on the internet says he wants to give me money. That sounds suspicious. What do you mean? Typically strangers who promise you money on the internet have their own best interest in mind. They often use bounced checks which will disappear shortly after depositing, but not before they've asked for some money in return. So he doesn't really want to spoil me? No. Well then what should I do? The best way to handle it is to block and report the suspicious message or even consult local law enforcement if you've already fallen victim. So I guess we aren't going to Key West for spring break. No. All right, look up here. One, two, three. Mom, Dad, I got it. I got it. Oh. <laughs> Right, Mom. I have. <laughs> There's no harm in wanting to have fun while in college, but it's easy to lose track of how much you've had. Apps like Drink Control and Alcadroid can help keep track of your consumption and blood alcohol levels. If you or someone else does drink too much, the signs of alcohol poisoning are as follows. Pale skin, vomiting, confusion, low body temperatures, irregular breathing, blacking out, and it's hard to wake up or cannot be woken up. It's an exciting time of year, but it's important to be responsible. If you suspect someone is suffering from alcohol poisoning, get help immediately. You will not get in trouble for seeking help if you are underage. 
For more info and resources, go to UNT's Division of Student Affairs. What's wrong? Are you stuck in your paper? Pretty much. I haven't written anything in like an hour. Why don't you check out the writing center at UNT? Well, how do I meet up with them? All you have to do to make an appointment is visit the writing center's website and either call the number or email writingcenter at unt.edu. The appointment is 30 minutes long and the trained tutors will be able to help with brainstorming, correcting grammar, ensuring clarity, and a wide range of services. They also do walk-in appointments. That sounds awesome. I'm gonna check them out. So, what's this paper do? 30 minutes. For more information, visit the UNT Writing Center's website. Yeah, it's six pages. So a man's been walking in the desert for days at a time. He finally comes across a bar and orders a Coke. That's not funny. With the exception, oh, well, the votes continue to come in from around Texas and the nation. Here is what we have at the moment. So, uh, Donald Trump is clearly in the lead for the Republican primary with 74.2% of the vote with Nikki Haley trailing uh, with 20.7% of the vote. And uh, Ryan L. Binkley, nowhere close. Uh, President, current President Joseph R. Biden is clearly the Democratic favorite with 88.5% of the Democratic vote. Now moving on to the U.S. Texas Senate primaries. To Republican pro candidate Ted Cruz is in the lead with 88.8% .8 of the Republican vote. And Colin Allred is in the lead for for the Democrats with 78.6% uh, of the vote. And now moving on to the U.S. representatives for District 26. Uh, we have 6,606 for Scott Army, 802 for Mina Biswas, 234 votes for Vlad De Francesi. 24,160 votes for Brandon Gill, who is clearly in the lead. Then we go into 44,340 votes for John Huffman. 142 for Jason Kurgoski. And 880 for Joel A. krokowski rusian 1,414 for Doug Robison, 2,141 for Luisa Del Rosa, 731 for Mark Rutledge, and 339 for Burt Faker. And those are all the numbers we have for right now, so stay tuned to hear the updated numbers later on in the show. With the exception of the West Coast, polls across the country are now closed and the primary votes are in. Early voting wrapped up last Friday, and the Texas Secretary of State reports the number of registered Texas voters has increased, and so has Turner Vote Out. 
1.8 million Texans stepped up to the ballot box during this election's early voting period. This is 700,000 more voters from the last primary election in 2022. Here in Denton, around 630,000 citizens took the opportunity to vote early. 2024 saw 50,000 more local vo voters at the polls than the last primary election. Although Texas has one of the largest under 30 adult populations in the country, but they vote less often than other Texas voters in the different age groups. Many, Texas, many Texans criticize the accessibility of voting for younger citizens. That's right, Brooke. The accessibility that some younger voters have can be limited or even non-existent, depending on where they live. Especially if they're a student here on campus, they might not even know how to register to vote or where they can register. NTTV's Chris Goodwin went out to investigate why some student voters might not be showing up to the polls. Chris? That's right, Mauricio. The student votes matter. Another presidential election year is nearing its end, and with that, you're probably already starting to see campaign ads everywhere and political advocates working around the clock to inform and register citizens to vote. I am registered to vote. Every election cycle, people everywhere are told to register and vote, often being overwhelmed with the overload of information about political agendas. Here on campus, many students don't know about resources dedicated to help them digest all this information. The Vice President of the U.S. Division of Student Affairs, Dr. Melissa McGuire, helps oversee North Vote Texas, an organization on campus dedicated to helping students register to vote and get informed. Dr. McGuire also helps organizing voting locations on campus, something which has been debated on in recent Texas legislation. Just March of last year, Texas Republican Kerry Isaac filed a bill to ban polling locations on campus, saying it was a threat to student safety. However, UNT still remains an advocate for voting on campus. I think it's a benefit from a convenience standpoint to have UNT be a polling location. I know community members and you know, the UNT community both really value the ability to be able to vote in our campus, so we're going to continue to advocate for it as long as we can. The threat on campus, however, is not towards student safety. It's students being unaware to helpful resources throughout these election cycles. I think sometimes when students see the table, they're not sure what we're wanting to talk to them about, even though we say that we're here to help them register to vote. Um, I think that a lot of students that I've talked to have actually when they've been at events, they said they've already been registered, so that's why some people are quick to kind of just walk away. Oftentimes, students like Amici find the whole process of discussing registration and elections overwhelming when they're on campus. Um, I just kind of try to get out of the way because I am registered to vote. Um, it's just not in Denton, um, but I never really think maybe, let me say I'm registered to vote but not here, so let me switch over and do it right now. Um, but I usually try to get in and out, so I just tell them, move out of my way. Um, I don't really have like feelings for it. I just try to avoid it. However, organizations like North Vote Texas make finding information like registering in Denton County accessible from the comfort of your own home. So even if you're in a hurry to class, check out the website at studentaffairs.unt.edu slash vote, as well as stay informed by checking out tables when you have downtime on campus when it comes to vote again in the fall. Currently, Dr. McGuire has confirmed students will be able to vote in the next election cycle this fall here on campus. That's all I have for you guys. Back to y'all at the desk. Thanks, Chris. You know, Mauricio, the numbers are critical, but so is the support and commitment from the supporters of each candidate. Oh, absolutely. And we have MTTV reporters at various locations this evening. So let's check in with Jim Peeler, who is at the Democratic Watch Party. How are you doing out there, James? Thank you very kindly, Kayla. So the U.S. Senate has 34 seats up for re-election this year, and Colin Arred is seeking just one of them. The Democratic Party holds the lead in the Senate by just one vote, plus the tiebreaker vote, that the Vice President of the United States fulfills in the role as President of the Senate. All the Republican Party needs to do is flip just one seat to have a full tie in the Senate. Now, things are ramping up here at the uh, All Red Watch Party, but there's been no sign of the candidate yet. Inversely, the Democratic Party is in the minor minority in the House. The Republican Party holds a narrow lead with a majority of 219 held seats, and the, Democrat and the Democratic Party holds 213 seats. 
but there has been legislation that has occasionally failed in the House in close four votes, due in part to the House Freedom Caucus, made famous by Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene. One of the main issues faced in Congress is an inability to compromise on key issues. Now, that's all for me here. 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 Let's go over to Kayla Bumpus over in Arlington. How are things going over there, Kayla? Okay, we're about to go on. Thanks, James. With me, I have Republican candidate Matthew Lucci. Matthew, you're very young. You're only 25. What exactly made you want to run in the first place? Yeah, wonderful question. Uh, the thing that really made me want to run was just seeing how our entire district and really our entire country has been run by career politicians, folks that uh, in many cases don't even live in our district, don't work in our district, um, aren't fighting for us here at home when we have a drug crisis that is ravaging our congressional district, when we have um, an economy that makes it harder to put food on the table, gas in the tank, and a roof over our heads, and no one in Washington, D.C. doing anything about it. You know, I, I spoke with my beautiful wife, and she told me that, look, this is something God's putting on your heart. Get out there and go do it. Um, and that's really the, the catalyst for me jumping into this race. That's incredible. And now that you are officially running, how do you feel? Well, obviously there's a mix of emotions. We've been at this for, for 10 months. We've been going all over the district. Our district includes 13 counties from Tarrant County all the way up to Callahan County. Um, and just the amount of work that we put in has been tremendous. Um, I can't thank my wife enough. I can't thank my staff enough. I can't thank all of our volunteers enough for all of the hard work they've been putting in from day one all the way through election day to day. So we're, we're all excited uh, about the results coming in. Absolutely. And that's all I have for now. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Kayla. Now for more from our reporter, Drew Maurer, who is with Marlisa Marin from Common Cause. How you doing, Drew? Thanks, Mauricio. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with Common Cause, Marlisa, what is it? Can you explain it to people who maybe aren't as well-versed in politics? How would you talk about Common Cause? Sure. Um, so Common Cause Texas is a organization that uses a combination of grassroots organizing coalition building, policy development, public education, lobbying, and advocacy to work towards solutions that ensure that our elections are free, fair, and accessible. We're part of a larger coalition, the Election Protection Coalition, which mobilizes volunteers to help our fellow Texans navigate the voting process and cast their votes without obstruction, confusion, or intimidation every election cycle. Awesome. And how, how do you have people get involved in an organization? I mean, how do you encourage these people to join? Um, and how many people do you send to the polling locations? Sure. Um, so we run a volunteer program. We basically do recruitment through local organizations. Um, as I previously mentioned, we are a part of a coalition. So um, we have over 100 organizations um, that are a part of this coalition. Um, including organizations like ACLU Texas, um, the Legal Defense Fund, um, uh, TCRP, or the Texas Civil Rights Project. Um, so through organizations um, like our partners um, and ourselves, we're able to reach out to our members, and that's really how we recruit for our um, program. Um, as far as how many, uh, today we had about 30 uh, poll monitors. Um, and that was earlier today. Um, we had 30 poll monitors um, across the state. Awesome. And what kind of role do you guys serve in the election process? Um, and how, how do you provide services to people at the polls? Sure, yeah. So um, our nonpartisan voter program, um, again, seeks to ensure that every eligible voter who wants to vote can do so um, and that every vote is counted accurately. Um, so our poll monitor volunteers identify issues at the polls, they answer um, questions for voters, and they connect those who are denied a ballot to legal resources. Um, in addition to our field program, we also have attorneys and voting rights experts um, that are able to help answer hundreds of calls coming in um, from Texas voters through our 866 Hour Vote Hotline. Absolutely. And what, for this primary today, uh, what offices were up for vote besides the presidential primaries? Um, what are the other things that people were able to vote for today? 
Sure. Um, so there were a ton of local um, races. I know for my uh, county in particular, there were uh, races for sheriff and for uh, county judge. Um, but there were also some Senate races up uh, for election. And with it being the primary right now uh, for the larger statewide races, we're really elected, well, not electing, but um, choosing which candidates are going to um, go on to um, face one another um, at the general election. So there were a lot of elections um, and just depending on where you're located in the state, which county you're located in, um, it would vary which uh, local elections uh, were on your ballot. Awesome. And yeah, for Texas government has been instituting a lot of new things in, in regards to uh, controversial issues such as immigration and abortion. Uh, do you feel like these are big things that are driving people to the polls uh, today? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think I think Texans definitely are um, motivated to vote, um, especially given the, the issues that have been um, really prioritized um, by the state legislator this past session. Yeah, and back to more of what you guys do, voting security. How important is it to keep uh, fairness and integrity in the polling process? It's very important. Um, and, you know, I think it's really al also just as important to point out that um, there are people who have been working hard to manufacture distrust in our election systems um, for their own partisan and political re uh, reasons. But our actual election systems continue to be secure and trustworthy. Um, this election cycle uh, was actually really um, uh, fairly quiet, especially particularly um, in comparison to the last presidential primary in 2020. Um, so despite our state government being intent on making voting harder, um, this election went relatively smoothly um, compared to the last presidential primary. Um, so problems like poll sites not opening right or poll workers not being properly trained um, could have very easily been prevented if the state allocated adequate resources to our elections. Absolutely. Well, we'll come back in just a little bit. We'll have more questions about how the importance of voting plays a role in Common Cause. But for now, we'll send it back to the desk with Mauricio and Brooke. Guys? Thanks, Drew. Now, how many times have you seen or heard an anti-candidate ad this week? Probably once or twice today alone. Well, according to UNT's political science professor, Matthew Espasoja, negative campaigning has been on the rise since the 1970s. He shares some insight into the impact of the negative campaigning right here in Texas. What we know about the impact, it's really sort of this uh, contradiction in some ways. For the diehard voters, perhaps in a primary, uh, it can have a negative effect on the opponent. So it is effective in terms of reducing the vote share that a candidate may receive. But on the other hand, an overarching negative campaign, more in the general election, can lead to voter turnout. Yeah, I think uh, in a state like Texas, you're not going to see a lot of it because a lot of the races just aren't competitive. Where you're going to see it is sort of later in a campaign. The first phase usually is, this is who I am, this is my story, positive, positive, positive. But then in order to chip away at the incumbent, usually a uh, vote share, you have to go negative. You start to have to raise questions about the candidate. Um, so Texas will have some, but it's gonna be in pockets, right? It's gonna be in competitive house uh, races. We'll see uh, with the, the Senate race, um, you know, whether that is next. One of the downsides of negative campaign ads is they could deter potential voters from voting at all, leading to lower voter turnout. And on the topic of modern polarization, there's no question that for every student, regardless of where they are on the academic ladder, social media is critical. It's one of the most important ways we interact with each other on a one-to-one -one level and engage with people on a bigger scale. So let's find out what is going on tonight with that all-important social media platform. NTTV's Brian Clark and Sydney Johnson are at Chilton Hall Studio. So guys, what have you all been seeing and hearing tonight? Thanks, Mauricio. It has been a very lively night here on social media, and political polarization has never been a bigger issue than now. We see it online with our friends and with our family. Polarization is not something that we can avoid anymore. Most of the UNT students we talk to think of polarization as counterproductive and destabilizing. One commenting that it is being so far out of the overturned window that it feels mainstream, and it feels like the mainstream has been threatened. 
voters aren't just seeing other political parties as incorrect, they're seeing other parties as immoral. This means that a member of the political party aren't necessarily wanting to be with other voters just like them. They just want to avoid those they will argue with. Thankfully, this might change. As we saw earlier tonight, UNT students are like other young voters who are frustrated with the two-party system and are starting to side with the political candidate because of a few key issues. More and more, individuals wish that they were more parties to choose from, as they no longer fit in just one or the other. One of those key issues voters are passionate about is the overturning of Roe v. Wade. On our social media polls, we noticed that a significant number of individuals avoided answering any questions about the topic of abortion. However, those that answered, 75% believe that abortion should be legal in all cases, 15% believe abortion should be legal in only specific cases, and less than 10% think that it should not be legal at all. Disagreement from the Supreme Court ruling go from polite with the comment, reproductive health is between a woman and her doctor, to the frustrated, with one calling it a sound constitutional decision that overturning has been disastrous. After the decision to eliminate the right to abortion, almost two dozen states have banned or limited access to the procedure. However, no matter the issue, UNT students believe that education is needed to prevent extremism and polarization. Later on in the show, you'll hear more about how national issues affect local voters. But for right now, let's get back to Studio B. Thanks, guys. When we come back, there are major changes in power coming to the U.S. Congress in both the House and the Senate. We'll break down the scenario for you. And our panel of experts will join us with their observations about one of the most controversial social issues in this election cycle, abortion and reproductive rights. More after the break, to st so stay with us. The do's and don'ts of the Poll Rec Center. See that man over there? Please do not hog weights. Instead, do this. Another important part is having an attentive spotter. See here is an example of a non-attentive spotter. Instead, do this. Now we head to the track, which should be pretty easy, just it's important to pay attention to the way the track goes. Remember to wipe down the equipment after you're done using it. The towels are provided by the gym, so it's pretty easy to wipe down the equipment when you are done. Thank you for using the Pole Recreation Center. Has this ever happened to you? My bike! My bike is gone! Stolen bikes are an epidemic sweeping college campuses across America. What am I supposed to do? It's quite simple. The We Mean Green Fund has partnered with the UNT Police Department to offer free bike locks to any UNT student with a bike. Just show up with your bike in tow and ask. Now I'll never lose my bike ever again. Enough worry. Get your bike lock today. Welcome back to Your Decision 2024. Time to check in on our latest numbers. As for the Senate, the two expected frontrunners in the primary are winning. On the Republican side, including incumbent Ted Cruz. And as for the Democrats, Colin Allred is also holding a commanding lead. And Brandon Gill is still leading in District 26 and remains the frontrunner on the crowded field for District 26. Now, of course, we'll update you later once the numbers change. This year, there are a number of seats in both the House and Senate. In the House, that they're up for grabs. Politicians who are either re retiring or running for another office. 
43 seats in the House and eight seats in the Senate are on the line, and a shift by just two or three could mean a drastic change in the balance of power in Congress, regardless of who wins the White House. Currently, the Republicans hold a slight majority in the House with 219 seats to the Democrats' 213 seats. Four seats are vacant. All members of Congress are up for re-election, and that's a total of 435 people. But 43 are not running, and that's the key point. One of the congressmen who is retiring is Mike Burgess, the longtime Republican congressman from Denton. Tonight's election will determine who will be on the ballot in November for that seat and which Democrat and Republican will be the challengers. On the Senate side, the Democrats currently hold a slight majority. 51 Democrats, which includes three independents who vote with the Democrats, to 49 Republicans. Five seats here are up for grabs, and that includes a big one here in Texas, Senator Ted Cruz. He will face the winner of the Democratic primary, who will be chosen tonight. And with the potential of razor-thin majorities in both the House and Senate, some of the most controversial social issues debated in the past two years could be back on the table. And probably one of the most emotional one is the issue of reproductive rights, the issue of abortion and the growing efforts by state governments to set their own rules for regulating the situation. The historic Supreme Court ruling overturning the right to abortion in Roe v. Wade sparked this now political debate. NTTV's Chanel Young joins us now in the studio with more. Chanel? Thanks, guys. Abortion. It's a topic we are more than familiar with and has been argued over four decades. The issue will never be outdated as women's lives remain heavily impacted all over Texas. Let's check in with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Unfortunately, due to state law, this health center is unable to provide abortion services at this time. It's a common message posted by clinics in Texas, including Planned Parenthood. When the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, many women in Texas began to go through these stages of grief. Now, about two years after the Dobbs v. Jackson decision, an unsettling reality has loomed over Texas. The implication of the Dobbs decision is a woman's body is not her own. The counter argument is the woman's rights are still intact. We're just now also protecting fetal rights. Um, but the reality is that the fetus is inside a woman. Many women seeking an abortion are in marginalized communities and low income and can barely afford what it takes to get the procedure. Despite exceptions to the law, the monthly abortion rate in Texas has significantly dropped. Women are at risk of fatal complications due to pregnancy, forced to travel out of state for abortions, or facing lawsuits for helping others obtain abortion medication. An unknown number are experiencing unplanned pregnancies. Doctors in Texas are very anxious about uh, the fact that they have to delay providing potentially life-saving care to their patients. Despite being a life and death decision, this ban might not influence voters' behaviors. If it does affect voters, it's likely young people or groups who see Dobbs as a direct threat to their reproductive health and interest. For now, we can only imagine the future of the ban. Hopefully over the next, you know, two to five years, it will become a little more clear to doctors what they can and cannot do. Organizations are going to find ways to help as many women as they can. The abortion ban is not changing anytime soon, and there are broader implications that could put the rest of our rights in danger. See, the basis for Roe v. Wade was a concept called substantive due process. It's the idea that there are some decisions so fundamental that even though they're not mentioned in the Constitution, we protect them. So if the notion of substantive due process is eroded, those other rights may also be in danger. In fact, Justice Thomas's concurrence in Bob Dobbs hints that there are plans to overrule another decision as well. That said, the right to bodily autonomy goes beyond decisions to have children. And once this right goes, other rights may go too. Mauricio, Brooke, back to you at the desk. Thanks, Chanel. While national issues have been impacting lives here in Texas, the same can be said about issues here at home with national implications. Let's check in with NTTV's Avery Callens, who is with our expert panel for their observations. Avery? 
Thank you, Mauricio and Brooke. We are back with another pressing Texas issue that has national implication for our panelists. The Texas state and federal government have butted heads on border security for the past three years, with take Texas taking almost complete control of the border security issue. This debate is coming to a boiling point with a surge in migration in the upcoming presidential election. Mr. Ewell, we can start with you. Does Texas have the right to take charge of border control issues? So, from a, from a legal standpoint, absolutely not, right? There is no situation unless uh, that, that Texas can regulate a national border. It's, or it's border with Oklahoma, sure, but when, when we're talking about the U.S.-Mexico border, they do not have the legal authority to, to implement security there. And from a moral standpoint, they don't have the ability to implicate the sort of security that they're trying to. Professor Loftus, what are your thoughts on this? Well, the um, uh, Supreme Court has temporarily stayed uh, the issue <clears throat> in terms of uh, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans, which is the most conservative appeals court in the United States, had uh, basically uh, allowed Texas to continue enforcing a new law which allows police to arrest someone on suspicion of being an undocumented person in the United States. The uh, Supreme Court has stayed that decision, which is perhaps an indication that the court, the Supreme Court is not willing to go along with the Texas law, that we really won't know that until we get to the Supreme Court for a full hearing on this case. Mr. Buno, anything to add? Uh, not very much. I agree with both of them that they're, historically that this is uh, almost unprecedented. And there, there has never been a circumstance where the United States has sat down and let a state dictate uh, the borders itself. It is the sole jurisdiction of the state. And what should we do about this recent surge in migration we have been seeing recently? Um, Professor Loftus, we can start with you. One of the things that we're finding is that there is a, a belief that the immigration is causing a huge problem for the United States. It's hard to see a huge problem except for the fact of the immigration. Uh, there's not been an increase in crime rates as some people would think there would be. Uh, there's not been an increase in taxation or uh, rather of, of expenditure of public funds. Uh, it's really a perception issue more than anything else. Sure, every country has to protect its own border, but this, in this case, I think we're seeing a reaction that is not exactly in keeping with the facts. Mr. Elwell, do you have any thoughts? I, I super agree with, with what Mr. Loftus is saying okay. here, but another thing that we should also be considering as citizens of the United States is this novel idea that migrants are also people, right? And so the way that we, we demonize them and dehumanize them is just, it's wrong, right? And we, we should be trying to take care of this population. A lot of times these are people that are fleeing violent situations and looking for a better life. And isn't that what America's about? Um, Mr. Buno, uh, what are your thoughts on this? I agree with both of them. I think that uh, with uh, Michael, I believe that, that we should be doing more to help them. We can do more. And with what Professor Loftus said, where her, uh, they are often a boon to the economy. They pay their taxes. They don't, don't commit as much crime as a normal citizen does. And it's just a matter of framing the issue. It's not so much the fact that there are immigrants coming. It is a, fact, a matter of how we perceive them as Americans. Well, thank you guys so much for this such a compassionate insight. We will be back once more with some closing thoughts. But for now, let's head over to our Spanish social media segment with Jose Moreno. What do you have for us, Jose? Gracias, Avery. Gracias, Avery. Mientras muchos, muchos se hacen oír en las urnas, queríamos saber directamente de nuestros espectadores qué es lo importante en esta temporada electoral. Una de las principales preguntas que muchos plantean es cuál debe ser nuestra prioridad en el control de las fronteras. Casi mitad de, mitad de las respuestas indicaron que prioridad, prioridad debe ser equilibrar la seguridad y la compasión, mientras que 38% 
de las respuestas afirmaron que el objetivo debe ser proteger los derechos humanos y la dignidad. El 13% de las respuestas afirma, afirmaron que la prevención de la inmigración ilegal debería ser el, el, el objetivo del control fronterizo. También se determinó que el estudiante medio de la UNT cree que la percepción pública de nuestra frontera está influida por la cobertura de los medios de comunicación. También preguntamos a nuestros telespectadores si se, se sentían segur, seguros con las políticas de inmigración de la administración de Biden y una abrumadora mayoría de ustedes afirmaron no sentirse <ríe> segura con las políticas de Biden. Con las visitas a la frontera tanto de Biden como del expresidente Donald Trump, el tema de la inmigración será uno de los principales temas de la conversación en esta temporada electoral. También queríamos saber qué porcentaje de, de nuestra comunidad participa en causas políticas. 57% dijeron que sí y 43% dijeron que no. A la pregunta de la política como parte de la comunidad latina, el impulso para que los latinos voten ha sido librado por los números organizaciones como LULAC, Voto Latino e incluso el propio Jolt de UNT. También queríamos saber cómo ha afectado la crisis del coste de la vida a nuestros telespectadores y la 80% dicen que sí, sí los afecta y el 20% dicen que no los afectan. También preguntamos si las creencias de las religiosas afectaban a los votos, lo que dio como resultado un rotondo no, no eh. Pero las, las, las elecciones de este año, nos aseguramos de cubrir todas las reacciones y de que su voz sea escuchada. Ahora eso es todo lo que tenemos en el seguimiento. Volvamos al estudio B para más noticias. Gracias. Thanks, Jose, Avery, and panel. When we come back, we will join our noticias colleagues with an update for our Spanish language viewers. And we will head back to Austin for a look at what is happening at the state capitol, along with an update on the numbers. Stay with us. I'm so tired. I feel ugly. I'm not okay. I didn't know UNT had counseling services. Maybe I should check it out. This looks like the place. So a man's been walking in the desert for days at a time. He finally comes across a bar and orders a Coke. That's not funny. Eh? Eh? Welcome back to Your Decision 2024. Now, as for the numbers, everything seems to be pretty much the same as it used to be. In Texas, Republican Ted Cruz and Democratic candidate Colin Allred are still leading strong in the Senate primary. In District 26, Brandon Gill is still holding on to his lead in a crowded race. Stay tuned for the last numbers update coming up soon. As the numbers keep coming in, let's join NTTV's April Pierdon in Austin. April, what's the update from there? Is it broke? 
Thanks, Brooke. Here in Austin, Governor Greg Abbott and State Attorney General Ken Paxton are continuing their efforts to change the state legislature. Paxton is seeking a political revenge by endorsing the challengers of over half of the 60 House Republicans who voted to impeach him on abuse of office charges. As for the governor, he is focused on unseating a group of Republicans who voted against his school voucher legislation a heavy priority of his. As for the 15 House Republicans seeking re-election, they have found themselves on the wrong side of both politicians by voting to impeach Paxton and to blocking Abbott's program. A few of the candidates up for election on both politicians' bad side include um, repre representatives Rogers, Allison, and Burns. That is all I have for now. Back to UNT in Studio B. Now that's the latest from the Capitol, so let's head over to Chilton Hall, where our Noticias team has an election update for us for our Spanish language viewers. Adelante, chicos. Gracias, April. Ahora vamos a echar un vistazo a los números actuales. En la carrera presidencial, estamos en la fiesta o en el partido republicano Donald Trump. Está ganando con un 64.2% de los votos, con Nikki Haley todavía en segundo lugar y en el partido demócrata. Joe Biden está ganando con 87.4% de los votos. Y ahora vamos continuando con el distrito 26, donde Hill todavía tiene ganando ese distrito con 57% de los votos y todos los números que tenemos ahorita. Bueno, el voto latino será muy importante, muy influyente en todo el país, ya que el número de votantes con derecho a voto ha aumentado en los últimos cinco años, según Clarisa Martínez, vicepresidenta de la iniciativa del voto latino. Alrededor de 34.5 millones de hispanoamericanos serán elegibles para votar en las elecciones de 2024, lo que convierte a los latinos en el grupo racial y étnico de más rápido crecimiento en el electorado estadounidense. El número de votantes hispanos elegibles ha aumentado en 4.7 millones desde el 2018, según el análisis del Pew Research Center. Dice Martínez que aunque lugares con población hispana tradicionalmente tal como California, Texas y Florida, se consideran estados claves para el voto latino, estados como Nevada y Arizona son los que hay que estar pendientes en el 2024. Nuestro reportero Sebastián Nava nos tiene más. De la oficina del Censo de los Estados Unidos, los latinos constituyen ahora el mayor grupo étnico del estado de Texas, con algo más del 40%. Aunque los latinos constituyen la mayor parte de la población de Texas, algunos expertos entre ellos la doctora Valerie Martínez Evers, profesora de ciencias políticas y directora del Programa de Estudios Latinos y Mexicoamericanos de la UNT, afirma que la comunidad aún no ha capitalizado su potencial poder político. Aunque los latinos representan un porcentaje significativo de la población de Texas, la cuestión es si acudirán a las urnas. Hasta ahora han tenido un bajo rendimiento y por eso están infrarrepresentados. Su rendimiento es bajo aquí en Texas. En parte es la cultura del estado. Texas en sí mismo no acude a las urnas. Cuando miramos a la población con derecho a voto en Texas, siempre obtiene peores resultados. Puede que no sea un problema en sí, sino que los latinos de Texas siguen la cultura de un estado en el que la política se percibe como algo en lo que no todo el mundo participa. Ahora se está prestando mucha atención a los temas que serán prioritarios para los latinos cuando vayan a votar. A los latinos le preocupan los mismos temas que a otros grupos, buenos empleos, sanidad, educación e inmigración. Cuando hablas con los latinos sobre inmigración, tienden a estar a favor de los inmigrantes. Incluso los latinos de la frontera son pro-inmigrantes, pero su enfoque sobre cómo gestionar la inmigración sería diferente. Reportando para NTTV Noticias, yo soy... La decisión del Tribunal Supremo de Estados Unidos el año pasado de eliminar el derecho al aborto en todo el país fue un momento de triunfo para los conservadores que habían trabajado durante cinco décadas para anular la sentencia Roe v. Wade. Casi dos docenas de estados controlados por republicanos han aprovechado la sentencia para imponer nuevas restricciones al aborto, restringiendo el acceso a este procedimiento a decenas de millones de mujeres. Pero la sentencia también ha convertido la cuestión en un obstáculo político para los republicanos. La reacción de los votantes se atribuyó en gran medida a la reducción de votos republicanos en las elecciones legislativas 2022. 
la campaña de reelección del presidente Joe Biden y los grupos demócratas pretenden situar el derecho al aborto en el centro de la contienda por la Casa Blanca del próximo año. Y aumentan los informes a caos dentro del Partido Republicano en la Cámara de Texas con el gobernador Craig Abbott y el fiscal general Ken Paxton, supuestamente buscando venganza contra sus compañeros republicanos. Vamos con nuestra reportera April Pierdant, que tiene más desde Austin. April. Gracias, Ramiro y Betty. Se dice que Paxton está devolviendo el golpe a, a varios republicanos de la Cámara que votaron a favor de la destitución del fiscal general por varios, uh, por varios cargos de abuso de poder. Y Abbott está uh, devolviendo el golpe a los republicanos que votaron en contra de la, de la iniciativa del dinero de los contribuyentes para ayudar a los, a los padres que necesitan ayuda a pagar los costes de la educación y entonces uh, por esta razón uh, hay 15 republicanos que se encuentran en el punto de mira tanto de Paxton como de Abbott y se enfrentan a ponentes que cuentan con el apoyo de ambos. Esta uh, ruptura um, en el Partido Republicano de, de, Texas, de Texas será importante tanto hoy como en los meses previos a las elecciones. Y esto es todo lo que tengo para hoy. Um, de regreso con ustedes, Omar y Ramiro. Gracias, April, y gracias por acompañarnos en la cobertura de las elecciones en español. Asegúrense de acompañarnos los lunes a las 3 y media para más noticias en su idioma. Ahora volvemos al Estudio B con Mauricio y Brooke. Thanks, Ramiro, and Omar. We'll be back in a moment and head out to the Democratic and Republican watch parties to see how they're doing. And we will touch base with Drew Maurer and Common Cause, so stay with us. Good evening, my name is Amanda Hasbell and I'm joining you here today in the Union parking garage. Today we're going to be going over how to drive safely in the parking garage. Let's go see. Oh my god, oh my god, this girl just got hit by a car. Let's go see what happened. Ma'am, ma'am, are you okay? Are you okay? Uh, did you see that lady hit me with a car? Yeah, we did. I got it all on video. Oh my god. Let's go over here and talk about how we can prevent that. Yeah, not the hospital. Well, right now we're going to ask you a couple questions on how we can drive safely in the parking lot. What are ways that we can be aware of our surroundings? Oh, we can look both ways. Jenna, also, how about putting the distractions away? Yes, just like our phones, turning our music down, and also not focusing on our passengers. Where can you get information on how to get a parking pass? Transportation.unt.edu. If you park in a garage, make sure you pay on the app or look for further instructions on how you should pay. And remember, no pass, no park. Let's all try to keep our mean green community safe. Remember, we're all in this together. Drive safe. All right, look up here. One, two, three. Mom, Dad, I got it. I got it. Oh, you're fine. Has this ever happened to you? My bike! My bike is gone! Stolen bikes are an epidemic sweeping college campuses across America. What am I supposed to do? It's quite simple. The We Mean Green Fund has partnered with the UNT Police Department to offer free bike locks to any UNT student with a bike. Just show up with your bike in tow and ask. 
Now I'll never lose my bike ever again. Enough worrying. Get your bike lock today. Ugh, a 20 minute walk. I don't want to do this right now. Don't worry, you can just use transit. Transit? What's that? Transit is a mobile app that provides real-time tracking to connect buses, UNT shuttles, and even A-trains. Simply download the app, then tap on the search bar and type where you want to go. In a matter of seconds, you get results for all available routes. And the best part of it is, it's completely free for UNT students. What are you doing? I'm downloading it right now. Download Transit today and remember, make life better without a car. Did you know you have access to video equipment like DVDs, video games, and cameras? That's right, you do. Come on down to Chilton Library and fulfill your media dreams. Located on the bottom floor next to the student sculpture. Hope to see you there soon. Hey girl, you know you look good. I like the way you move and groove. I'm not sure. Welcome back to Your Decision 2024. As we wind down here at NTTV, let's check up on these latest numbers. Former President Donald Trump has won the Republican presidential primary in Texas. Ted Cruz and Colin Allred are still leading strong within their parties for the Senate, and Brandon Gill remains the lead in the competitive District 26 congressional primary. Now that's all the latest numbers we have. I'm curious to hear what lingering thoughts may have been prompted as we round out these numbers. Let's head back to Chilton Hall, where Avery Callens is joined by our panel of experts. Avery? Thanks, Brooke. With the short amount of time we have left, let's get a closing observation from each of our panel members. Um, Mr. Elwell, we can start with you. I think the takeaway message from today is that while change is hard and we're all so so tired of everything that's going on we can do it we just have to be diligent we have to do our democratic duty and we can be the change that we want to see wow thank you so much uh, professor loftus what do you have to say yeah i'm going to agree with that the uh, this year is going to be a test for our, de our democratic institutions and our idea of what the country is supposed to be and uh, so uh, we all hope that we can pass that test Yes, yes, and uh, what do you have to say? I, I agree, and I think that one of the key things uh, that we can continue to do is continuing to organize and continuing to vote and have faith in the democratic system, even in these rocky times. Well, you guys have certainly convinced me to get excited about this next upcoming presidential election, and I hope our viewers feel the same way. And that is all for our panel this evening. Thank you so much for your time, guys, and your insights into how this primary election has unfolded, along with its issues. Back to you guys in Studio B. Thank you, Avery. Why don't we head over to Drew, who's still wrapping it up over there with Common Cause. How about it, Drew? Marlisa here as we talk about the importance of voting. Now, Marlisa, why do you think our vote counts? I know it's a straightforward question, but why does every single person's vote count in the state of Texas? Sure. Um, so I think you hit the nail on the head um, when you talked about um, why voters go out to vote um, and specific issues that are important to them. Um, voting is, is an especially intersectional issue. Um, and it really affects pretty much everything in people's daily lives, right? So I think if folks are passionate about immigration or healthcare or, um, you know, vast, major, vast issues, um, then they should be going out and voting because we're electing the folks who are making these uh, big decisions on these issues that we really, really care about. So that's really why voting is very important, especially yeah. in the state of Texas. It is as diverse and, and um, you know, uh, powerful as it is. Absolutely. And just to wrap this segment up here, why should voters care about primaries? Obviously, you've already covered why their vote counts, but why should they care about primaries? Sure. Um, I think one thing that I constantly hear folks talk about is how they don't vote because they don't like choosing between two choices. Um, primaries are interesting in that they offer a vast majority of options. Um, and 
this is where you can actually decide what those two options are going to be come November. Um, so that's one big reason why primaries are very important. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for with, uh, being with us tonight, Marlisa. That's all for Common Cause. We'll go ahead and send it back to the desk with Brooke and Mauricio. Thanks, Drew, and thank you to Common Cause. Now let's pitch it back over to James Peeler with our Democratic Watch Party. James? Thank you very much, Mauricio. So I'm over at the Colin Allred Campaign Watch Party over in Dallas. Uh, things have been going well throughout the night. I, the room has become crowded. So in the state of Texas, Allred is leading the field by 65% although under 50% of precincts are reporting. The runner-up has less than 50% of the vote. Uh, that's all we have for now. Let's go visit Kayla Bumpus over in Arlington with Matthew Lucci's campaign. What's going on, Kayla? Thanks, Brooke. Right now, according to recent updates, Matthew Lucci is sitting at around 15%, with the goal for the end of the night to be 40%. That wraps it up for me from the Republican Watch Party here in Arlington. I'm Kayla Bumpus. Now let's take it over to James Peeler at the Watch Party. James. Thanks, Kayla. All right, we're going to go right back to our social media segment in Chilton Hall. Thanks, guys. Well, I think this year's primaries let us all know how important it is to stay connected on social media. And if you're a UNT student, make sure you stay in the know and get out there and vote. Knowledge is power indeed. And it seems like social media is where we're getting a lot of this knowledge from. So, yes, thank you to all of our Instagram audiences for the great responses and the survey questions. For our updates on all of our events and to take a closer look at everything NTTV does, check out the at North Texas TV Instagram page. That's all from us. It's Chilton, back to you at Studio B. Thanks so much, Brian and Sydney. And well, Brooke, quite the night. A lot has happened and a lot is still yet to be decided. Absolutely. We here at NTTV want to thank all of those who helped make this broadcast possible. We hope this helped you with your decisions as we move from the primary season into the November election cycle. Voting is our way of making our ideas and concerns heard and you'll have that chance again on Tuesday, November 5th. And thank you to all of you who are watching. Join us for NTTV Noon and Nightly News beginning this Thursday, March 7th. From all of us here at NTTV, thanks for watching and good night.